we had a wonderful session at the beginning of the year faculty meeting. Many of you, uh, the faculty members were there and recall the lively discussions we had amongst ourselves about what kinds of things we could showcase, whether it was published work or an emerging area of interest. And today we have a wonderful lineup that will be definitely an inspiration to all who are able to partake of this. We're going to hear from and appreciate our colleagues. Our lineup today is Dr. Michael Burkhart, then we'll go to Dr. Don Ball, then on to Scotty Warner, Dr. Scotty Warner, Dr. Christy McDonald, and Dr. Kevin McCormick, doctor, doctor, doctor today. And um, some of them are sharing their work from their dissertations. And so really excited to give your work a wider audience because I know with my dissertation, I think probably maybe six people uh, read that dissertation. <laughs> Lance, Lance Lewis is saying five for him and Don Ball saying seven read his and that's pretty typical. And you put a lot of work in and there are some interesting conclusions and these are very timely topics. We'll have really very high energy, quick presentations, really that overview about 10 minutes and then about up to five minutes for question and answer after that. And we will just, you'll be able to, speakers, you'll be able to take those questions from the podium. Dr. Lund will be giving you the three minute and one minute warnings just to make sure that we uh, keep to the time frames that we promised. So without further ado, I ask you that we please welcome Dr. Michael Burkhart, our Assistant Professor for the Insurance and Risk Management Program. He's going to be presenting his research on personal automobile policy continuous and sharing a predictive model that addresses the retention of existing customers in the industry. And this is something that whether you're from the insurance industry or not, retention of customers is vital to every kind of organization or company. So Dr. Michael Burkhart, please. Join us at the podium. Thank you, it's nice to be here. I certainly do appreciate this opportunity to present my dissertation findings. It's a rather long title. Effects of Perceived Service Quality, Customer Satisfaction, Perceived switching costs and price sensitivity on personal, personal automobile policy continuance and tension. With my bachelor's in marketing, my MBA in insurance, and my PhD in marketing, in, excuse me, business administration with a concentration in marketing, I combine these disciplines for my dissertation, which considers insurance policy retention and the marketing of insurance. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, in the United States, overview of insurance, there are 215 million automobile insurance policies. In 1897, Dayton, Ohio resident, Gilbert Loomis purchased the first automobile insurance policy from the Travelers for a premium of $1,000. Thinking about that, that was probably a lot of money back in 1897. Uh, there are 6 million car accidents annually in the United States, and there are 90 people killed each day in car accidents. Um, in the United States, there are 6,000 insurance companies generating revenues exceeding 316 billion annually. Oh, go on the side. An examination of the non-renewal rate shows that 34 million or 16% of insureds do not renew their automobile insurance with the same insurance company. The goal of the study was to derive new knowledge to effectively increase the automobile insurance renewal rate, thus stabilizing revenues and in turn increasing profits. The concern is that the average acquisition cost is 900 per insured. And this places the insurance industry as one of the three most expensive industries for customer acquisition. The math goes something like this. A 2% reduction in the non-renewal rate equates to a cost-cutting measure of 10 plus percent 
and a permanent 5% reduction in the non-renewal equates to a doubling of profits within a five-year period. In addition, there is a 30% increase in profitability, renewal business versus new business in the automobile insurance industry since insurance uh, companies have the advantage for renewal policies at looking at past claims so they can effectively price policies moving <coughs> forward in time. This study offers, an automo offers the automobile insurance industry an empirical study considering factors that predict influences on policyholder retention. And the, my study is quantitative. The variables, perceived service quality, the independent variable, is the customer's assessment of overall superiority or excellence of a service. Customer satisfaction is a mediating variable and is a resultant conclusion by customers based on a comparison of pre-purchase expectation to perceived actual performance. One moderating variable is perceived switching cost, which are the customer's ideas of the necessary compulsory additional efforts to make a change from one insurance company to another, such as time and effort. The other moderating var variable was price sensitivity, and this variable reflects how consumers feel about paying a certain price for a product. The dependent variable was continuance intention, and it refers to a customer's intention to continue using a product or service after its original purchase. The theoretical orientation, existing theory, conceptual framework, and model under investigation were based on the following three established and peer-reviewed foundational theories. The American Customer Satisfaction Theory underpins research through its use of customer expectation, perceived quality, perceived quality and customer satisfaction in measuring the level of customer loyalty and customer loyalty as a precursor to continuance intention. Expectancy confirmation theory explains post-purchase satisfaction in relation to perceived performance and disconfirmation of beliefs. Basically, the way we think, the way customers think, feel, and act after a purchase is made. And the third underpinning foundational theory was elaboration likelihood theory, which considers the central and peripheral paths that change consumer attitudes. For the research design, I used a cross-sectional web-based survey convenient sampling. The population included one, being a United States citizen, two, being a personal automobile policy holder, and three, paying for your own personal automobile insurance. The Likard survey questions were posted and collected by Question Pro, an online survey company. The G Power sample size was calculated at 129 respondents, but the study ended up with 207 respondents. The study utilized smart PLS modeling software to statistically measure each of the study's hypothesis. Smart PLS is a variance-based partial least squares structural equation modeling method. Data preparation included testing for excess kurtosis, skewness, and Kramer von Mises p-value for normality. To follow our two slides of sample descriptives for the 207 respondents, male and females were pretty evenly matched. The ages were appropriately represented. Education and income levels were evenly distributed. Over half of the respondents have had a past claim, and over half of the respondents have renewed their auto policy at least three or more times with the same company. Get this, over 30% of the respondents have shopped for their current auto insurance in the past year. So that's the issue in the insurance industry. So many people shopping for insurance. Almost 60% of the respondents enjoy a multi-policy discount. 
84% of the respondents had one or two persons listed as drivers on their auto insurance policy, and 85% of the respondents insure only one or two vehicles. The measurement model analysis included indicator reliability, internal consistency reliability, convergent validity, discriminant validity, and culinarity. Um, the structural model analysis included significance, direct effects, explained variance, and predictive relevance. All of these uh, were within the measurement and structural model appropriate parameters. Now on to the results. Four out, of, four out of five hypotheses were supported. A surprise to me, hypothesis four was not supported. Perceived switching cost, the time and effort perceived by an insured to switch from one company to another insurance company did not have a significant influence on the dependent variable continuance intention. Of interest in my research to find any significance uh, for the moderation of perceived switching costs, I first thought maybe the moderating effect of price sensitivity was so large that it eliminated any moderating effect of perceived switching cost. So I ran the P, uh, smart PLS analysis without price sensitivity, but even with price sensitivity eliminated, perceived switching cost was still insignificant, which surprised me. Then I uh, completed smart PLS analysis of males and females separately. And it, and it was then that I did find a significant negative moderating influence by perceived switching costs for females. So a summary of the findings validated that perceived service quality should not be underestimated as a vital determinant of continuance intention. Also, policyholders giving perceived service quality high marks also gave uh, the mediating variable um, satisfaction high marks, and these two constraints together improve policyholder continuance. Furthermore, price sensitivity negatively influenced and ensured continuance intention. So more simply stated, the more price sensitive and insured, the more likely that the insured will switch to another insurance company at the end of their policy renewal, which logically made sense. For insurance companies, retaining insureds not only potentially helps improve profits, but also helps offset new customer recruitment, advertising, and marketing cost. The loss of insureds for an insurance company is the biggest threat to survival. This dynamic also lends insight into the service versus price dynamic, providing the insurance industry direction for implementing service, price, and marketing strategies. Future research may include the addition of other, other policy types, such as home and commercial insurance, along with other predictive constructs. Furthermore, the model could provide other industry guidance towards their own studies on continuance intention, as Kristen said. Thank you for your attention, and I appreciate this opportunity to present my findings. Are there any questions? Yes. Back to the hypothesis slide, would you add one um, Someone else is operating this. <laughs> okay. Do the hypothesis slide. Yes. As to how you define the construct of perceived service quality, was it left open? Was it defined as as perception of customer service in terms of time to response question and inquiry? Was it 
time for resolution of claim? Was it? Okay. How exactly did you define it? Okay, so the definition was for perceived service quality was per prior studies definitions. I adopted their definition. As far as the application to um, applying that to the um, Likert survey question, is that what you're really asking me? Yeah. Right. Um, I used um, previously um, peer reviewed um, surveys on perceived service quality for the questions that were provided to the respondents to answer. So there were several. So there were several different Likert items. Correct. Exactly. So yes. Okay. Michael. So I'm really surprised that the switching costs didn't um, have an effect, and I wonder if your data, either you might already have the data, do what I'm about to say, or maybe another survey. I wonder if maybe the kinds of people in the survey, let's say if they were already answering like online survey questions, they might be already the kinds of people who are comfortable with shopping for insurance online. You know, you can, right, you can go to the website of a dozen different insurance companies, get quotes within a few minutes, or they might be the kinds of people who already use an insurance bureau. So maybe there's a big, if, I don't know if your sample already asked them, how do you shop for insurance? You know, do you use online or a bureau? And maybe you can like stratify your sample, or maybe you would just have to, figure out a way of surveying people who aren't the kinds of people who are comfortable with using the internet and see if in those types of people do the switching costs matter? Right, definitely to your point, everyone that responded are um, online savvy, for sure. I'm, but I did um, get a proper representation of each um, age group. Oh, he already has the other one up. I would have showed you the slide that shows the, um, the age groups, but they're appropriately represented for the, um, for the population at large. So yes, um, I see your point, um, but I, um, in all the questions in the Likert survey were from previous established um, studies. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you again, Michael, and congratulations too. He recently finished his doctorate and you can see he knows his stuff and you definitely exemplify what it means to be a scholar practitioner, which is part of our DNA here at Northwood University. And in fact, all of our present presenters today do that. And our next one is Dr. Don Ball. And he is a long time faculty member, adjunct faculty member in the adult degree program. And he'll be sharing information regarding his study, exploring leadership's business, cultural assumptions and practices within the higher education industry influencing graduate employment success in the 21st century. What's great about this is we know that when students are selecting a university or a college or a program of study, they're looking at ROI and they're thinking about what kind of career impact. So Don, this is as, it, this is as timely as ever in terms of a topic that is of great interest. So we look forward to your presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Don Ball. That was quick. Can I go back a slide? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Takeaways. Really simple. Higher education of business. If it's a business, what product or service does it provide? And is it higher education meeting the needs of the communities it serves? Last decade, the media. The government reports have consistently said that we're not matching graduates with jobs, especially from those people that are coming out from the higher education industry. HEI is not meeting those because there's no national education goals or employment needs. One thing I, I, I always get a kick out of is the last one at the bottom here where it says that higher education is a $565 billion industry that is fueled by the Higher Education Act that gets reapproved every three to five years. So the research question. Research question, 
The study defines or seeks to answer the following research question. How does higher education industry's leadership of business cultural assumptions and practices affect graduate employment and success in the 21st century? Now, 33 years ago, the post or California Post-Secondary Education Commission report on higher education at the crossroads plan for the 21st century addressed funding and facilities issues for a growing student population. Now, this was state colleges in California. Okay, that's the University of Southern California, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, it didn't address once we graduate you, are you going to be successful and get a job? Okay. I always like Duderstadt in Poland. Does anybody know who Duderstadt was or is? Okay, James Duderstadt was former president of the University of Michigan. Yeah. Okay, yeah. who's polling? I was going to say, and uh, had that one of uh, the great uh, foundations as well. Right. Yeah. Red Poling was the president of Ford Motor Company. They were part of a study done by the Business Roundtable corporate mm -hmm. leaders. What's the next group of graduates supposed to look like? Okay. The Business Higher Education Forum spanning the chasm corporate and academic cooperation to improve workforce preparations. The industry believes that university employers, employees, are not meeting the needs of students to be better prepared for graduation and college employment. Remember Duder, Staten, Polling. We're going to come back to them. Okay, 21st century skill sets. 2012, Pellegrino and Hilton said that. The next set of skill sets that students need to have when they graduate from colleges and university are effective communication, collaboration, critical thinking, problem solving, persistence, and all this has to be done within the core academic curriculum. So have you ever had a student that says that I don't get it? Or how does this equate to what I'm going to do when I graduate? Okay, we'll come back to that. My clicker's not working. Got it, thanks. Okay, my methodology. My methodology was exploratory qualitative inquiry. Okay, my little bit of my background, I spent 31 years as an investigator for the Coast Guard on active duty and reserve. So I got to sit across somebody and ask them questions that made them uncomfortable. So now I want to be an academic, so when I ask the questions, I can't make them uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> This is used to explore the relationships between higher education industry's leadership, use of business cultural assumptions and practices. This allowed the researcher to explore, collect, and document information regarding business cultural assumptions and practices. That's the theme here. Did I have fun interviewing 13 people? Yes. Research process. Okay, there is a divide in higher education. You have the institutions of higher education and the proprietary institutions of higher education, okay? IHEs are the traditional, the PIHEs are the for-profits. And if you've looked over the last five to seven years, the for-profits have shrunk, as have the institutions of higher education, okay? It's a shrinking dichotomy. Um, these were all high-level business officials that included presidents, vice presidents, chief academic officers, chief financial officers, and those people that were responsible for curriculum design. It also allowed me to have a greater pool of people to talk to, okay? Now, student outcomes. When we talk about student outcomes, what does everybody think of? You think of the fact that once we graduate a student, they walk right into a position with a company and can use their degree. Okay, that's, that's the student outcome that we're looking for, all right? The issue that we run into is that we're not aligning those things for future graduates to receive those positions or to walk into those positions, okay? The degree gets you an interview. Sometimes it doesn't get you the job because you might not have the skill sets that that employer is looking for. Okay, results. 13 participants, 
provided their thoughts and insights. And we came up with the following. Five themes. Course alignment for employment. Lack of association between higher education and business. Lack of goal completion. Non-transforming programs. And availability of employment opportunities. Okay. This is what I love the most. One of the people that I interviewed turned around and told me that we're a $7.2 billion earned price. Okay, must have financial rigor that would characterize any Fortune 500 company, but we're not a business. Okay, and then on the other hand, culture is quite different because education is not an industry. All it does is provide public good rather than a commercial product. So are our graduates commercial products? Okay. Uh, for proprietary institutes to higher learning or higher education, our students are mastering outcomes that really matter toward employment and success. And when talking about that with employers as well as with students and faculty, allows employers to have more confidence that the university graduates will do well. So, institutions of higher education, proprietary institutions of higher education, is who links better with businesses when it comes to graduates. Now, I want to just throw out a couple things real fast. I stayed away from engineering. I stayed away from medicine and science. And I stayed away from the business side CPAs. So this is just a student graduating right now and going out into the industry. Okay. Ah, takeaways. Higher education to business. Yes or no? I have a yes. Okay. If it's a business, then what product and service does it provide? Students, educated workforce. Okay. And is higher education meeting the needs of the community it serves? Yes or no? I'll let you guys answer that yourselves. <laughs> questions. How did I do on time? Okay. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. So I guess, do we, how much is the, do you get a sense or do the questions get a sense of, are they lacking like the most basic improvement in like critical thinking, problem solving, or is it, like, well, you know, they're not learning more industry specific things. Like, how deep is the problem? You know, can they not even like write in grammatically correct sentences? Or, you know, can they do that, but they don't, can't apply it to their specific industry? Or... It's, it's a balance between the employers that you talk to and the literature that we review. If you look at the business roundtable, they're yelling and screaming for people to come out of universities and be able to read, write, have critical thinking, and be able to work in a team and communicate. Okay, if you talk to the proprietary institutions of higher education, the for-profits, they'll turn around and tell you the graduates that we're putting out will meet all of your needs because we base all of our programs on what industry wants. Okay, institutions of higher education try to do that and depends on the success of the student. Any other questions? Yes, sir. And did you look at, uh, were you exposed to the Carnegie ladder in terms of, right, so when you look, when you define higher ed, did you, what, what were you defining as tier one schools? Would you go all the way out to um, community colleges? No, we stuck with, we stuck with the four-year university. Four, so four, four years, year so, yep. publics and then the for-profits. Public, private, and the for-profits. And profits. private as well, okay. Yep. Any, um, when you, when you interviewed your 13 people, any any um, faculty senate representatives in there at all? Yes. Okay. Did you find anything interesting in their perspective? Their perspective to me was interesting because when 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 we talked and we tried, I tried to in the interview process, I tried to be simple. I tried not to be an interrogator rather than question like I would if I were a student. The, the interesting part from the faculty senate side was that they understood the challenges, but they weren't sure on how to incorporate the challenges to change the programs. 
if you look at education, if you look at higher education and you look at the evolution of it, and you look at it over the last 10 years, it is evolving. It is trying to get there. It still has a ways to go. Any other questions? Thank you very much for the opportunity and greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you, Don, and we really appreciate that. And that makes me think of Northwood must be on the right path with uh, landing in the top 12% among institutions nationally in the Georgetown University study for return on investment among business schools. So, or uh, actually for business programs nationally. So uh, definitely speaks to uh, your work, Dr. Ball, and how important it is. Well, next we're gonna be hearing from Dr. Scott Warner. And he is an assistant professor and he is going to discuss his literature review for a research project on a very timely topic as well, compassionate leadership. And when we think about the majority of our students reporting that they have some form of mental anxiety or mental health needs, uh, compassionate leadership is more important than ever. And Dr. Warner is going to share some insights on his literature review in this area of compassionate leadership. Please welcome Dr. Scott Warner. Thank you. So all we have to do is follow the headlines, folks. You're gonna hear things, mass shootings, school shootings, war deaths, uh, deaths related to fentanyl overdose. It's the headlines which is driving a new way of how people are dealing with grief, and that's called complicated bereavement. What I'd like to do is take a few minutes and share with you some preliminary research that I have done looking at the elements of complicated bereavement, and I laid in the foundation of setting the stage for compassionate leadership. So if we look at the events that I shared, we're gonna see some things that are in common. The first one is they have a sudden, unexpected nature of the death. The second one is there's some sort of exposure to a traumatic event. And the third construct is that there's a lack of social support. So let's begin with my problem statement. So the problem is employees are more frequently being traumatized by the death of their loved ones due to fentanyl overdoses, mass shootings, military, and COVID-19 related deaths. So what this does is it creates surviving family members who suffered from complicated bereavement. They may face many challenges which may impact their long-term employment with their existing employers and the challenges, how do employers respond with, these, with compassion? So what I'm planning on doing is conducting a qualitative research study, which will provide the return to work experiences after, after the loss of their loved ones from fentanyl overdose, mass shooting, military death, and COVID-19. So to set the stage, I threw in some information that I've gathered regarding my literature review to set the foundation for this. So what we find first is that Charles Edward identified that leaders can show human commitment to other people, irrespective of status at work. So bereavement provides an opportunity for the workplace leaders to support those employees affected by death, and thus also support the motivational health of the organization. So business leaders need a style which will move the team forward. So I'm laying the foundation here uh, for moving towards compassionate leadership. Charles Edwards also presented that three people are depending on their leaders, especially if they occupy a position of influence support. If the leaders handle the issue well, the work environment has the potential of helping people when they are most vulnerable. Leaders can demonstrate that they mean it when they talk of being concerned for other people at work, as well as the organization's success on a whole. So what is complicated bereavement? So, Complicated bereavement is a result of a deep grief a person may find himself in a state of complicated bereavement. Complicated bereave mourning is not something that occurs because of pathology in the bereaved individual, but it arises because of the challenges, isolation, 
and lack of support that individuals face trying to accomplish normal mourning. Also, losing a loved one is profoundly upsetting and disturbing experience. Of the greatest clinical significance is a subset of grievers, usually about 10 to 15 percent, who experience persistent and disabling systems related to the loss. This syndrome, variously described as prolonged or complicated grief, has substantial and long-term effects on the well-being and role and functioning. So the interesting thing that's happened, folks, is when I did my dissertation uh, for my doctorate, and I did it on grief in the work environment, this was uh, five years ago that I completed that. Up to that point, complicated bereavement was really the exception. What's, what, what's happening is because of the traumas that our society is being impact on the whole, complicated bereavement now is becoming more commonplace. So continue the discussion. Uh, let's talk about compassionate empathy. So what I say about compassionate empathy is they're like sisters. They look alike, but they're different. So empathy is defined as the ability to understand and share the feelings of another person. It involves both the cognitive and affective processes with the cognitive component being the ability to take another person's perspective and the effective component being the experience of a similar emotional state. So in the paradigm I'm working from, empathy is the foundation for compassion. So compassion, on the other hand, involves not only understanding and sharing a person's feelings, but also a desire to help alleviate the suffering. It includes both an emotional component an emotional, I'm sorry, emotional component and a motivational component, with the latter being the desire to help. And this really sets then the foundation for what type of leadership style would help in us uh, deal with this. And this really gives the rise of what we call compassionate leadership. So compassionate leadership is an emerging leadership style um, that emphasizes understanding, empathy, empathy kindness towards employees and stakeholders. Uh, define compassionate leaders as the recognition and acknowledge of other people's pain, followed by actions to alleviate the pain. Research has suggested that compassionate leadership can improve employee well-being, job satisfaction. In a study conducted by Dutton, Workman, and Hardin, employees who received compassion from their leaders reported great job, greater job satisfaction, engagement, and commitment to the organization. The study also found that compassionate leadership was positively related to employee well-being. So my goal from moving forward would be to do a qualitative study uh, starting off with a pre-qualifying survey uh, from the candidates selected to the pre-qualifying survey. Uh, do, using some sort of random selection of those qualified candidates and then leading them through uh, phenological study research. I'm going to end on a question. My question would be like this. So if I, you don't have to answer. But if I ask the question, how many of you would say you were comp compassionate leaders and you would raise your hand, what would, what would it what would it be like if I asked your followers if you were a compassionate leader? And that's what I'm going to be doing essentially in my research. So I thank you for this opportunity to share my preliminary research to a study. And the other part of this was I thought, well, you know what, guys? If I do this in front of you, it forces me to have to finish it now. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Most of us would see it relatively recently. Et Obviously, sudden traumatic death through car accidents or other kind of accidents has been around for all of human history. There is something qualitatively different about the type of traumatic death that, that we're seeing now versus what's always. Obviously, you've had warfare as long as human right. existed as well. So That's a really good question. And the way I would answer that is what I believe is taking place is we're finding these collective experiences where before it would be more on an individual level. Now we're finding that these are taking place in mass experiences. 
And the challenge is for the work environment is if we're being, uh, if we're having large, let's say you have a community that was impacted by a school shooting or a mass shooting. Do we have the resources for a population of people? And that's really setting the stage for, um, you know, I don't want to say like things are becoming normalized already, but almost these, these really hot topics <coughs> have a sense of being normalized. And I just, I'm a, I'm, I want to be cautious that we are addressing what's really going on in the lives of our followers. And can we really make a difference? Uh, but I hear what you're saying. I just think that this is, we're in a whole different level because if I go back to the research, even 10 years ago, this was a very small population. And now we're getting larger amounts of people who are being impacted. Yes, Chris. Could you give us a sense of uh, the range of time that a normal grieving mm -hmm. process would be versus the complicated bereavement or prolonged grieving? Yep, great question. So the timing, uh, you can look at a couple different studies. It may start as early as six months, but uh, it may take up to 18 months before a person even realizes they're in complicated bereavement. So that's when I mentioned about it being long-term. We have to be able to have a long-term strategy with this is because you may not even know that your follower has complicated bereavement. You might be seeing some things along the way, but you may not have a diagnosis for you know maybe 18 months. So that's quite a long time. Yes. So one of your precipitating factors, I think you said, was lack of social support. Mm -hmm. Is that lack of social support in general in one's life, or is that specific to the organization? I think that's a society on a whole. Uh, I think my personal experience is that uh, people just don't know how to communicate with people who are grieving. And it's easier to, just, to stay away from it than actually engage with that person. Yes, sir. We've heard that there are various stages of grieving to get through the process. In this new environment, is one of those stages more pronounced than the others? I really don't know how to answer that question uh, because grieving is such a personal journey and impacts people differently. I don't know exactly when it, it, one person may enter a complicated bereavement at a certain stage and another would, would not. Thank you. Well, thank you, Scott. And we hope that you do finish that study because it should shed light on a really important situation. We're glad that you're doing that work. Our next speaker is Dr. Christy McDonald, and she has finished her doctorate in the last several months. And she really represents how our staff are scholars as well. And her area, she's our director of financial aid, and her qualitative study interprets data from three perspectives to identify veteran students' barriers to higher education, something that I know she's personally passionate about, and also we're passionate about here at Northwood University as a gold military-friendly university. And you're one of the reasons why we have been able to achieve that status year over year, along with our other staff who serve those who have served in our armed forces. And so on this very important topic, please join me in welcoming Dr. Christy McDonald. Thank you very much. And has, as Dr. Stay Howard said, this is very personal to me. Um, when looking at a research topic, I kind of dug deep and looked at my passion for student success in higher education. But also on a personal note, I watched my husband, who was a combat vet, go back to um, college after pretty much serving a very small career in something totally different. And I watched his struggles day in and day out, just the different things that he encountered in the classroom that I thought, I don't think other students encounter that. So that's kind of where my interest came. And then when I was looking at a topic, I'm like, this could really um, help Northwood University. So I'm very fortunate that I was able to do my study here at Northwood. And I interviewed Northwood students, faculty, and administrators on this topic. Just a little bit of background on me, my bachelor's is from Northwood, um, my, my master's is from Central Michigan, and I just recently completed my PhD at Walden University in higher education leadership and policy. So I did a qualitative, a basic qualitative study. I interviewed 12 people in total, one-on-one -on -one interviews. 
I interviewed administrators, um, three administrators, four faculty members, and five veterans. And the five veterans actually um, represented five branches of the U.S. service, and they actually were um, different ages of service that they, they actually committed to our, our country. So that was really interesting. I had two research questions when I did my um, study. One was actually basically just what's the perspectives of administrators, faculty, and veterans on the barriers that they face in higher education. So let's identify what those barriers are and then how can we address those barriers? So we looked at the perspectives from those three and, um, subsets and how we could look at both of those, what they are and how we can actually ident or to address those. So when I did my study, like I said, I did one-on-one -on -one interviews with the 12 veterans. I did, or 12 um, individuals. This took place late 2021, just to kind of put it into context. Um, and so when I went through my hand coding, yes, I hand coded <laughs> all of my data, um, there was five emerging themes. And so the veteran resource awareness, transitional barriers, and generational differences within the classroom, those fell under research question one. So that's how we identified the barriers that veteran students face here at Northwood University. And then the last two on understanding and identifying psychological triggers and dedicated contact person on campus was to answer research question two, which is how can we address those barriers at Northwood University? So let's kind of unpack what those themes were and how we can address them here. Veteran resource awareness, actually all of the subsets, the administrators, faculty, and veterans, all spoke about the lack of veteran resource awareness. Not that they were never told that there was resources available for veteran students, but if they were approached by a student, they really didn't know what to do with that student. So if a student came up to them and said, I have no idea about my veteran benefits or where I go for, say, um, even housing help, they had no clue where to send that student. So right there, they're identifying that that was a barrier for our students and the faculty and administrators. They also talked about how veterans or the faculty members were very open to helping veteran students. They were just kind of lost. So the, the, the want is there to help the veteran students, but also identifying who's a veteran in their class is also something that we struggle with because we don't make them identify, which we shouldn't. The second thing was generational differences within the classroom. I think this is really interesting because I think what I found in the study could be applied to our adult degree program as well, because there's a lot of generational differences that sit within our classrooms, either online, virtually, or in the classroom. So we see that with this segment as well. Veteran students, veteran students and faculty spoke about the length of time that it is for veteran students to be in high school and then going into college. So sometimes there have been 20 years from a veteran student being sitting in a classroom and now they have to go back to college and how do I do this? And also understanding the technology differences when, when they went to high school is different. How are they gonna you know, dedicate their time to study with having a family and different types of things, that, different challenges that they might not have had right out of high school. In addition, that support system that students have leaving high school and going into college is pretty large. So people are in your corner, they're saying, go to college, you can do this. And then you have a veteran student who served their country have a lot of lived experiences, and then they go into a college atmosphere, and how do they have that support anymore? They really don't. And in reality, they're juggling a lot because they have additional responsibilities that they would have had as a high school student. The other thing is the fear of fitting in with younger students. So there's sometimes lived experiences that aren't real pleasant, and so there's a lot of triggers within the classroom that maybe some conversations that are in a lesson, say a history lesson, could actually be a trigger for a veteran student sitting in a classroom. And a lot of faculty members really don't think about that when they're teaching because they really, you know, that's really probably back of their mind. They're not thinking, how is a student in my classroom going to react to this lesson that we have today? And then also the transitional barriers, that's a big umbrella, but the biggest one for that was a, basically that faculty member really cannot pinpoint when the, those students might have transitional barriers, because first of all, they might not know the student's a veteran. If they don't disclose it when, say, you do introductions in your classes, sometimes they'd go through an entire semester and not know that a student was a veteran in their classroom. And so it makes it really hard for them to understand those transitional barriers that students might have in their classroom. There is a huge fear of failure among veteran students. Actually, one of the faculty members, I think it was actually administrator, said that they worked with veteran students, and as soon as there was a sign of failure, that veteran would call and say, I want to withdraw. Because there was that stigma. They didn't want to ask for help. They have a lot of stigmas against help seeking in the military. And then also, they just had this over feeling of failure. So they didn't want to fail the course. They didn't want to receive an F. They'd rather just back out of it and just be like, I don't want to do it anymore. And so that was really um, relevant with the veterans and the faculty members. And then another thing that's a big transitional barrier from them is they go from a very structured environment. So they're basically told when to go to child, they're told when to go report for duty, and then you send them into a higher education institution and say, 
plan it on your own. Do it on your own. We're not, we'll help you, but there's not a lot of that structure. They have to learn those barriers themselves to kind of understand what, how they incorporate their time and how they can do that successfully to be successful in higher education. And I did hit on this, the help seeking social stigmas. There's a lot of so, social stigmas with veteran students. So they, they want to be looked at as tough. They don't want to be help seeking. They struggle with that. Um, but we kind of have to normalize that behavior and understand that it is normal to, to help seek, especially when you have that gap, that they have all these different transitional barriers basically piled on together to, to navigate through higher education. The other two, understanding and identifying psychological triggers and a dedicated contact person. Those, like I said, were for research question too. I have to say with our verticals that we've done, we have actually made some progress in these two areas, which I'm very happy to say. Um, understanding and identifying psychological triggers. Like I said earlier, we don't know what those triggers are. And it's not just PTSD. When you think of veteran students, you're thinking, oh, they have PTSD. They can suffer from high anxiety, depression. ADHD is very common. And so there's a lot of different triggers that students can have that aren't just their normal PTSD type um, active type of um, symptoms that you might see. So our faculty and staff all said that basically we want to learn how to identify those. Or a faculty says, if I'm sitting in a classroom and I can visibly see that somebody's struggling with a conversation, how do I approach that veteran student without you know, making them uncomfortable? But how do I have that conversation so I can help that student through that? And so that was a big one. And veteran students, when I spoke with them, I thought this would be a touchy one because of that help seeking, but they were very open to being recognized that they might have a struggle. I think there was a sense of relief, like, okay, there's somebody else looking out for me now, not just myself. And so I thought that was really interesting. Um, with a dedicated contact person, I think we've made great strides on this. I know there's a lot of talk about having a veteran student dedicated for um, advising and stuff like that. But the veterans spoke a lot about having a military connected person. They feel more comfortable with a military connected person. And also they wanted somebody along the way. So I recruited you, but guess what? I'm your, your go-to person your entire career at Northwood University and I can help you and I can find all of the resources that you need. So the regulations with the VA are changing. They change a lot. The, the laws with um, different type of veteran resources, it's almost impossible for several people to keep abreast on those changes. And so if you had one dedicated contact person, that person could be that, that resource and that expert on campus to help those veteran students um, through the process. And so where do we go from here? Oh, I wanted to share a quote that I had from one of my veteran students. He said, if I would, I would say that for me, the barrier was social stigmas. I was afraid to ask for help and allowed myself to be vulnerable. I was a product of my environment. I brought in all the social stigmas around the military and the military culture. I always looked at asking for help as a weakness, and I did not want to be seen as weak, especially being an older student. I did not want to be looked at as being dumb. And I have to say that quote in different variables was all the way through the veteran. Um, they all talked about that. They just didn't want to look, be looked at as being different. Like they felt they were different enough. They didn't want to be looked at as another layer of different in the classroom. So I thought that was very interesting. So where do we go from here? So I think we do a great job supporting our veteran students, but as I, anything, there's there's can be improvements that we can make. I do think we should evaluate the intake process of our veteran students, and should it look different as other students? Or is there subcategories of students that might benefit from a different intake process for those students? To so make sure that they have those resources available, available to them, or they know where to go for them, and so that way they're completely equipped with all that they need to be successful here. Restart the military strategy team. <laughs> I think that's a, a very big one. I think there's a lot of value into getting the military strategy team back up and running. It was really robust for quite some time. And with COVID, we kind of just one of those things that it was hard. But I think we have a, enough players at Northwood University to make that a really robust group. And I think there's a lot of benefits that can come from that to help support our veteran students. And then um, we are doing a lot of work on this, but campus-wide education, how to identify and support psychological triggers. Uh, and this is campus-wide, not just for veteran students. I know Andy Sovis is doing great work, um, but what does that look like on campus-wide? Like how can we train our staff and faculty to identify when a student may be struggling, veteran student or not? How can we make that more uh, on the forefront? And then how can we create more awareness about resources available to veteran students? Most of our veteran students are online students. And so how does that look in a virtual environment? How can we make sure that veteran students sitting in Texas have the same resources available to a student sitting on campus? And what does that look like to build that type of community online? And do we have an online community for students to have a veteran group that's virtual and so that they can be connected to other like-minded individuals at Northwood? 
and so they have that group like our students do here on campus. And questions? Yes. I'm not sure if this is exactly a question or a comment, but you <laughs> think of something. So I'm thinking uh, as, a, as a professor who teaches mostly freshmen, mm -hmm. of course, like I assume that someone, for example, has given them an orientation and told them all the different resources. Yes. But you know, maybe it's still maybe it's still necessary or not. You know, like in the syllabus, for example, it lists a bunch of stuff like over. Say, look, if you need to, you know, if you're you know, mm -hmm. with the syllabus, it says libraries with or here's the technical support number for IT, and here's the number for this, and it's all listed in the syllabus. I say, you know, read through the syllabus, or if you can't remember, come to me and I'll figure it out for you. You know, but maybe there's other things that need to be in there in the syllabus too. Maybe we just need to have some idea. If there was like a cheat sheet, just say, hey, professor, here's your know, professors, here's 10 mm -hmm. pages of all the different support services. Don't memorize this, but if a student comes up to you, here's a list of everything you can possibly send them to. Yeah, and I think it's hard because we require a lot of our faculty to kind of remember all of those things and then be the resource to the students. And I think that's where that dedicated person kind of comes in. So like if a student came to you and they were struggling with something, you could say, well, guess what? We have an expert in the area. This is your go-to person. And they probably already know that person, so they might not come to you in the at all because they would have had that person that connection in the beginning and I don't know how feasible it is but they just like that connection and they like that um, that the streamlined process they don't they don't like to go back and forth to different people to kind of find out what their answer are I mean I think a lot of students are like that not just veteran students but yeah yes did they see each other as resources per se, or did they see each other as support, or did you not get a sense there really was even necessarily Mm -mm. Uh, any kind of a community of there really isn't and like I said most of ours are online students so there really isn't that sense of community which I think there's value in that I think there could be definitely an online community for our veteran students because I do think that they seek like like I said like-minded individuals or they might be struggling with something that other students in their class they couldn't talk to another class in their the student in their class because they would never understand it you know I think about my husband and if they were talking about Afghanistan in a history lesson I mean he, that would be a trigger for him but nobody else would have that as a trigger so I think there's there's value in having some some sort of connection to those veteran students, for sure. Yes. Do you find they had a preference between online or face to face that they preferred one or the other or struggled with one or the other? Um, I think actually the veteran students that I went, most of them were, we had one in person, the four were online, and I think they I think they navigate the educational process very well. I do think that they are very good as far as being students. I think the technology piece is a little bit of an adjustment, but I think that overall they were all great students. And I will say they all liked the Northwood philosophy. And I think that's a, a, it is a streamlined process from the military into the Northwood philosophy. So they all felt that connection. So I think we could definitely capitalize on that. Yes. Misty, is there anything that you think of first that the faculty could do to sort of cut off Right? The triggers. Right? Yeah. What, what can I do? It's so individualized. You know, I think it has a lot to do with, and I, I really think Northwood probably is in a better situation than other schools because of our curriculum is a little bit different. I don't think there's as many triggers in the classroom, but um, I had one um, interview that I did, and it was just a, it was just kind of the situation, like a group work. It was a trigger not necessarily the topic. So sometimes there's a lot of high anxiety and just putting them into a group of people they didn't know was a trigger for a veteran student. So it's not necessarily a topic based, but maybe just kind of like reading the room to kind of see if you can say anything. But I mean, some people are just gonna be, you're not gonna know, so. Yes, Kent. Christy, um, well, first of all, this slide makes it very clear why we get each other's email. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. I just want to connect it back to yeah. what I thought was really interesting on <laughs> connecting a student from entry into Northwood all the way through. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that reflected in where we go from here? Um, it's not, but it could be added. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a really, really mm -hmm. uh, neat um, thing. I think it's a differentiator. I do too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a comfort level. There's, you know, there's a trust build up, particularly if you're saying that they will leave very quickly at the first sign of mm -hmm. maybe failure. Yep. Yeah. And they get the runaround at the VA, the Veteran Administration, so they don't really want the runarounds at their higher education right. institutions. So I think if we could streamline that, make it an easier process, I think we will win in that category. Yep. Yes. On the board of the Saginaw Y. Okay. And last year they implemented a 
they paired up with the VA mm -hmm. and they have uh, a veterans intake person. They, they just basically they help do. be a resource for mm -hmm. veterans in the county. And, it's and they do a really... Successful. Yeah, and they do a really good job, like talking to veterans when they leave the service about things. But the problem is, if they don't use it right away, they they don't go back and recall that. And so they almost need that ref that same thing refreshed again when they go into college, so they can basically recall all those things that they were given. I think they just want to sign out and be, you know, they're on their way. So I that think that person is a veteran. Yeah. Feel See. Going to that yeah. Person. Yeah, it makes a big difference. It really does. Yes. Actually, one Kirsty, there's probably a lot to do also for like uh, similar things for like first generation students. Mm -hmm. Remember, I forget, he was recently, someone told me this blew my mind. They said, you know, when you, when you tell students about your office hours, make sure you explain them what office hours are. Because yeah. <laughs> it never occurred to me. I put it on the syllabus, I just tell them, okay, no office hours. I realize, okay, now when I go to the syllabus, okay, these are the hours I'm guaranteed to be in my office that you can come talk to me about anything. Because I'm like, yeah, if you know, kids didn't, whose parents didn't go to college, they literally don't know what that right. is. Right. Well, I think there's a lot of things from the study that could be applied campus-wide, not, not specifically for veteran students, but I think there's value in things that they pinpointed. Then, like, oh, other students could really benefit from that. So I think there's value to first generation, stuff like that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Well, thank you, Dr. McDonald, for your passion for serving those who have served, as well as all of our students. And finally tonight, we have Dr. Kevin McCormick, and he's going to be, he's actually in one of the hottest areas since the pandemic, and that's the supply chain. Uh, and he has uh, given many talks on that topic. And today, he's going to focus on how uh, to validate the IT adoption model for analytics applications by leveraging their research on analytics orientation, which is really important. It's pretty technical sounding, but when you think about it, we're adopting technology all the time. So the applications are probably endless for this. And so we're looking forward to your comments. Uh, our Associate Professor of Operations and Supply Chain Management, Dr. Kevin McCormick. Christy, you triggered me. <laughs> when I got out in 1977, nobody gave a damn. No, so I'm, not. I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Anyway, uh, this is some research I've been doing for 30 years, actually. Um, I started on this journey in 93, 94, and uh, was working with companies on ERP systems and um, kind of group technologies um, and they were hiring me to go and help them install this and make it successful and it was uh, an eye-opener and I did it uh, all through the 90s and I fell upon this research in 99 about uh, why it why were ERP systems successful and I used that through the 2000s up until 2017 I finally jettisoned that business and uh, and the research and I probably did about a hundred maybe 110 companies around the world. So as I'm doing analytics now, and we're doing research on analytics, since about 2014, my group and I, we started to say, you know, there are similar patterns here. This looks like, uh, you know, ERP systems and what they, what they ran up against, and, and the ones that were successful look like this, and the analytics applications that are successful look similar. So we said <clears throat> we're going to charter a research project to find out does this pattern hold and what are the differences and uh, why do people need it. Uh, companies like Dow Chemical, for example, um, we started to work with them a couple years ago and they said, why can't we get analytics being used throughout the company? Very sophisticated company. So as we talked to people, we came, a, came to the same conclusion. Uh, these same things are going on that we saw in ERP systems. So, next slide. <clears throat> this is a, a diagram I came up with to explain this this theory in in 1999. And, and the the group that did this this initial research looked at um, I think probably a dozen applications across different industries and said this is how this technology works in an organization. There's a design build area where you know, groups of people and engineers and some users get together and they configure the system and then it rolls out and creates havoc 
that's this transition state. People start, well, how do I know? What, is, what does it do? How does it affect my job? Um, you know, it's a it's dramatic change. Sometimes they come out of it in non-use down here. And I have several case studies that I use for my students that are non-use case studies. And they have to figure out, well, what do we have to do to make this successful? Um, low integration means, all right, we're using it, but we really do excel. <laughs> We do this, makes people feel good, but we don't really, it doesn't make any difference on our job. And then standard adoption means, all right, I'm forced to use it. I haven't changed what I basically do, but I'm kind of using this and it's making people happy and they get off my case. And I'm, I'm using non-theoretical -theor descriptions of these states. There's uh, several descriptions in the research, but uh, I'm paraphrasing. And then uh, expanding, means, uh, okay, this is, has changed the way we work. Uh, we've changed the software maybe a little bit. We've changed the work a little bit, and we're starting to see benefits. And, uh, okay, I get it. That's the word people use. I get it. This is going to make our company better, faster, cheaper, more effective. And then this high integration means it radically changes the company. Uh, they see new opportunities. They see new new things uh, available, new markets. Um, it's, it's really uh, dynamic when you see this. So next slide. Uh, they, they theorize two states, this equilibri equilibrium state where th things are in order and things are working in these transition states. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Next slide, okay. This is what ERP systems do. They do the same thing, only there's a, there's a kind of, as Yogi Berra says, there's a fork in the road and you gotta take it. You get one or the other. You either go into the, the bucket of non-use and low integration and maybe standard adoption, and out of standard adoption, you head into expanding and high integration. It's, you gotta go into the standard adoption first. And we've observed this, as I mentioned, 100 and 110 companies. It got really boring. We see the same thing, different language, <laughs> different culture, the same thing. We wondered, why does this happen? I'll go to the next slide. Next one. Yeah, this is, this is the percentage of companies we saw. 80% were in the, in the bucket. And they spent, oh, I think there's $100 billion has been spent on on ERP systems around the world, maybe more. They've long ago lost count. Uh, it's in every company. And uh, the banks have a system. It's like ERP. It's like SAP. It's a different name. Healthcare has a system, different name, same function. Uh, we work with British Columbia Healthcare and have for 15 years. We see the same thing up there. So 80-20 um, is the rule. And it actually proved out. Okay, next, these are, these are the reasons why that that 80-20 rule exists. Uh, and this is a diagram from the initial research, so I apologize for the low quality. Um, you've got this deep structure that's below the, the procedures and the process maps and other things in a company that these are the way things work. You, we've all seen that. I call Marjorie if I need anything. <laughs> Tell me how to do this, Marjorie, and she tells me and I go do it. There's a deep structure there. Um, so every company has it. Every organization has it. And uh, the equilibrium periods are when things get in balance and people are using it and they're not going, oh, I don't, I have never been trained. I don't know how to use Noventive, Noventive, whatever that is. I get trained every six months by Mark. Um, so this equilibrium period and then these revolutionary periods where people start to say, you know, I think this may work. If I change my job in a certain way and you modify the software, we could change this and make this happen. This starts to create that disruption again. And then it settles down and people incorporate the new jobs. All right, next step. Next slide. Go ahead, next one. One more. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take, I hate to mention it, it's 30 years of research. Makes me feel a lot older than I am. But we're going to explore 
probably 10 or 15 companies over the next two years and um, use surveys and interviews. This is how we do things. Uh, the surveys will me measure um, the analytic applications that are being used, how well they're being used, how much they're being used, and uh, ask people to, to talk about how it's influenced their job, that kind of thing. And um, go to the next slide. So this is the model we created about 2005. I was working with Babson College and uh, in Massachusetts uh, with Tom Davenport, and we envisioned this business process model that's now become the standard model. You can see ad hoc, defined, linked, integrated, et cetera. This is the business process maturity model that's become uh, accepted around the world. And we created these analytic things that are appearing. And in 2005, there wasn't that many going on, so we couldn't measure it. We conceived of this. But now there's a lot of companies doing a lot of things in analytics, and we're starting to be able to measure these things. When you ask somebody, do you do this, and how do you do it? If they're not doing it, they say, well, I'm not doing it. I don't know, don't know what you're talking about. You, you know, you're measuring that it isn't there, which is kind of useful, but not really the kind of research that's fun. So now it's there. We've gotten uh, responses from people that say, yes, for example, reporting. This is the kind of reporting we do, and this is the tool we use, and this is how many people do it. It's pretty prevalent across the organization, and it's pretty effective. These are the questions we would ask in a survey or in an interview. Scorecards, people are starting to say, yeah, we use scorecards for our suppliers. We use scorecards for our internal process. They're starting to appear and be used normally, which is great. Um, some process models are being used where they say, yeah, we have a, um, an order fulfillment process model where we measure the outcomes and the quality and the perfect order rate, and we use that to, uh, to inform the process team and make changes. And uh, some predictive models. We've, we've organized a, a model that predicts when customers will leave. I think we just had one, right? When customers will be retained, when will they leave? People are starting to use those on a normal basis. So um, the two areas uh, in, under methods and IT, uh, we, we know we can measure those now. We've measured analytic orientation in the middle. We just completed our research, took four years, and we've determined and measured what analytic orientation is as a culture and how it impacts performance. And it's a positive influence on company performance when you can get people to be analytically oriented, meaning they care about data, they know how to work with data, they know how to work with models, and they know the value of it. This is an analytically oriented organization, of which we don't have one here. I can confess, Northwood is not an analytically oriented organization, just not your culture. Dow Chemical, a mm, little bit, not totally. Dow Corning was, but they've kind of been disappeared. Um, I've worked with Dow Corning for the last about 15 years. Um, and some of the spin-offs from Dow, some of them were analytically oriented and they kept that orientation. Uh, so we're gonna measure how well they're implementing analytical models. Does it conform to the same transition and equilibrium states that we saw in the ERP? Our ERP model is gonna take about two years and we plan on publishing it after that. Uh, we published two or three articles, Me, we meaning my research team, when I say we. Uh, it's a group of professors around the world that I've worked with for the last 20 years, and we publish two or three papers and journals every year about these topics. So that's what we're gonna do. Come back in two years, we'll have the results. Um, anybody wants to read our paper on analytic orientation, it's online in a, the Journal of Business, uh, Journal of Business Analytics, I believe it is, and uh, it's. I think you've heard a couple of presentations by me over the last couple of years, anyway. But um, that's it. Questions? Yeah. The companies that achieve that twenty percent when they reach equilibrium—that was replicable across systems, softwares, or it's not. It's not software specific. It's not specific to one software or another. Dow Corning was one of the companies that did it. Uh, and they used SAP, 
Um, other companies use QAD, uh, other packages. The British Columbia Healthcare used a healthcare package. It doesn't depend on software. It depends on the culture, analytic orientation, let's say, but ERP orientation. It depends on a leader that says, you will do this. And it's very, very important uh, that leadership function probably half the battle. And then changing the deep structure, sorry, deep structure in the jobs to, to take advantage of the software. Those are the things that make the difference. So if it exists, sticks, pretends to stick. Does it stick or when the leader goes away and another leader comes in, does it degrade? When I worked with Shell, Shell had a leader that was business process oriented. They were gonna make that company work. He worked for years to make Shell a uh, process-oriented, analytic-oriented company. When he left, the whole company just degenerated down to functionally oriented, let's say that, to be nice to him. And that's Shell, one of the most sophisticated companies in the world. So, did that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? How do we get to be this at Northwood is my question, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so what resources our company's building to move into this direction? Is it data scientists? Is it actuaries? We, in our research and in my experience, it's called tweeners. And we're creating those tweeners here at Northwood. Um, these are people that understand business and management, and they understand the technology and technology language, and they can translate that to the management and translate management things to the data scientists. That's the secret to make analytics work. Problem is they get out in the industry and they get to be lone rangers and everybody depends. We have one of our students that's in an internship and she's headed to Dow and she's helped uh, Corteva unbelievably change the way they work by just doing you know, visual analysis and showing it how these two functions, when you bring the data together, it has insights that they never saw before. But she's a lone ranger. She's going to go work for Dow, and she's going to leave Corteva. So you can create these tweeners, but unless the organization catches on and starts to learn and believe that what the tweener's doing is important, it'll just go away when the tweener goes away. Does that answer your question? Thanks. And I used to employ about 30 tweeners, and I made a ton of money just renting out these tweeners to go out to companies and do this. <laughs> And I know that sounds low life, but <laughs> that was a business. Yes, sir. Sounds like a capitalist. That's okay here. Thank yeah, you. yeah. I'm, that's a safe audience, I hope. <laughs> um, so I had a, a close colleague uh, do analysis around uh, successful ERP implementations in higher ed, and she landed on it was really um, talked about leadership and planning, and more on the people side than the technical side. Um, you touched on it a little bit earlier around the leadership. So you, had, you need these tweeners to do the bridging. Can you right. just talk a little bit more of what, besides being a champion or saying we are going to do this, is there anything else in there that, that um, you have seen that really helps a successful implementation? Because I suppose you, you do need a champion uh, within the executive team. Yeah, there's several layers of leadership. Yeah. One is the champion that says, here, we're going to do this. Here's the vision. Here's where we're going. Okay, put that aside. Uh, there's participation and involvement as somebody that actually participates in the activities needed to, to infuse this technology in the organization, and they're involved, meaning they're emotionally involved. They actually give a damn, and people know it, and they see it, and they go, wow, this must be important. This uh, leader is attending this meeting and actually learning this stuff too. This has got to be important, this kind of involvement. Those three things are the key to success. So maybe 10% of the leaders maybe do that. The involvement's tough. And, and do you see one position naturally do that, like a CIO or an HRVP or? Usually operations. Operational. The VP of operations or VP of supply chain, because that's where the money is. Right. Okay. And in university, probably be Kristen. Right. Or you. <laughs> not, to, not to put you on the spot, but if you wanted to become 
uh, analytically oriented, you'd have to be participate and be involved which I know you are, so I make fun of Northwood, but it's a great place, I love it here, so. Um, any other questions or outrageous comments I can make <laughs> to embarrass myself? All right, thank you. Well, Kevin will definitely be back in two years to see how this turns out. And I'd love to have a conversation because we have pockets of analytics and wondering about how we could expand that more authentically into the rest of the organization. But thanks for joining us, those who've joined us online and to all of our presenters, Michael, Don, Scott, Christy, and Kevin, you've really inspired us with the passion that you've shared and an inside view of the kinds of things you're pursuing as scholars and we're just really, so pleased and, and delighted to learn more. We'd like to, I, actually, this is our second Thought Leaders series, in their sec second in our Thought Leaders series, and we started this in the fall, and one of the attendees said, this is so great, let's do it every week. And now that might be a, a bit of a tall order, but we definitely are committed to doing this every semester, and I think you can see how inspiring it is, and I can see that it's also kind of spurred you on to uh, to move your research along as well or to share and promulgate the findings that you have in ways that will help us as a university. Truly a celebration of what makes Northwood University distinctive. You, our faculty and staff, your passion that you bring and you share with our students in the classroom and then outside of the classroom as scholars really furthering your own knowledge base and helping us serve them better in a different ways. Uh, for those who joined us in person, we have a reception in the lobby just outside of this room, and we look forward to welcoming you back. If you have an idea, faculty or staff, if you have an idea that you'd like to share a topic with us in the fall, please let us know. We are always uh, interested in what else we can showcase and learn from. So thanks as a learning organization. This exemplifies what we do, and we want to thank you again for joining us this evening.